all things Randy at RandyRhodes.com. Go, go for launch. Speaking truth to power, the Randy Rhodes Show. All right. And then this, Justin. Today at the UN, a lot of news. The Security Council passing a resolution for a ceasefire and hostage oh. release resolution in Gaza without condemning Hamas for the October 7th massacre. The U.S. deciding to abstain, according to the White House, letting that resolution pass instead of vetoing it. So Israel's Prime Minister Netanyahu says he is now canceling a visit to the U.S. by his top advisor, Ron Dermer, and his national security advisor for meetings that were to happen at the White House and the State Department on Wednesday. Joining us now is NBC's Raf Sanchez from Tel Aviv. And we should point out there is already an Israeli defense delegation here for meetings at the Pentagon. But there was going to be a much bigger and higher level meeting on Wednesday at the White House involving Ron Dermer, the former longtime ambassador here from Israel and the closest advisor, of course, to Netanyahu. And that is being canceled. Raf? That's right, Andrea. This is Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's way of signaling his fury that the U.S. allowed this Security Council resolution to pass. The Prime Minister, in a statement put out a little while ago, accusing the U.S. of abandoning its position at the U.N. Security Council, saying he is calling off that visit by one of his closest advisors and Israel's national security advisor, a visit that President Biden specifically requested from him in their phone call at the beginning of last week, their first phone call in more than a month. Remember that? Last week we said that they hadn't spoken to each other in a really long time, and then they got on the phone and they started talking, and Biden said, why don't you come over here, send me a top delegation of the leading experts in your country, and we will show you alternative ways to rout out Hamas without attacking Rafa. And then we introduced a resolution for a ceasefire, which Russia vetoed. Russia vetoed war, Russia vetoed ceasefire. And then Russia, I just find this fascinating, Russia was attacked by ISIS-K. Now, ISIS-K, by the way, is the same group that attacked at the gate, the Abbey Gate, uh, when we were leaving Afghanistan. You remember that, uh, where we lost 13 soldiers? That's the same exact terrorist group that attacked Russia, ISIS-K, okay? And uh, all of a sudden, Russia is now subjected to a horrendous civilian-targeted terrorist attack by ISIS-K, and suddenly they don't veto the ceasefire in uh, Gaza. Suddenly they're all about a ceasefire in Gaza, and the United States abstains, seeing that China and Russia, who are on the Security Council, which in my mind makes the Security Council a freaking joke, but thus the world turns this way, uh, and uh, so they didn't veto. They didn't veto, and the ceasefire was passed. The United States uh, abstained from voting. Now, last week, we introduced a ceasefire resolution where our resolution had three things in it. It had a release of hostages in exchange for a ceasefire. The ceasefire was to last uh, at least six months. Uh, I believe six months or six weeks. I can't, uh, I can't recall. And we were going to turn that into a permanent ceasefire. And it also had a... Um, Oh, it had uh, one other thing in it. Well, oh, it condemned Hamas for October 7th. This ceasefire did not condemn Hamas for October 7th. And I think the reason why it did not condemn Hamas for October 7th is so that the United States could then abstain and say, well, it didn't have a condemnation of Hamas. We couldn't vote for that. You see what I mean? It's very parsed. This whole, uh, you know, dog and pony show at the United Nations is all very parsed. But here's the thing. When the United Nations General Assembly votes, that is non-binding. Don't ask me why. When more of the world's countries weigh in, it's non-binding. But the elite Security Council, when they vote, okay, 14 countries, when they vote, that's binding. And any one of the countries can veto all the countries. And when you consider that the countries that can veto and do often is Russia and China, neither of which practices anything remotely like democracy, and that they can veto a democratic vote, 
<laughs> it just seems very hysterical. It just seems uh, very funny at this uh, point that the UN is irrevocably broken. But we managed to eke out a binding ceasefire today from the United Nations. Now, no one knows. No one knows if, uh, you know, Netanyahu will actually ignore the ceasefire, which, by the way, is binding. It's binding on all the world's countries, all the member countries. But he could ignore it, and then what? Then he goes to The Hague, I suppose, and he can join his friend Vlad, who has been, uh, you know, de declared a, a war criminal. Vlad has, because Vlad kidnaps children and brings them out of Ukraine into Russia and then re-educates them in camps. What kind of effect would that have while he's in power, while he's in power? What kind of effect would that have on our relationship with them going forward? Well, that's the interesting question, isn't it? What does America do if Netanyahu ignores it and goes into Rafa anyway? I mean, we have warned him a thousand ways to Sunday, starting last week. You know, we said uh, Jake Sullivan gave an amazing speech. Uh, it was three minutes long. Uh, well, it was more than three minutes, but I, I tried to cut it up into uh, smaller pieces. And, and the smallest I could get, I thought, because what you need to know, it, it would take a whole three minutes of your time. Which, when you consider that America's attention span is 46 seconds, and in Brett's case, less. <laughs> you got to cut that in half, then cut it in half again. Right? Howard, too. Don't understand it. Uh, really learn to live with it, because uh, that's the way things are. I've learned to live with it, so I don't play three-minute clips anymore. But I'm going to on the other side of this break, right? Because Jake Sullivan told Israel, told them, come over here. Come over here, send a top delegation over here, because we have alternatives to what you want to do in Rafa. We have alternatives to sacrificing the lives of tens of thousands of innocent uh, civilians in Gaza. We have an alternative to routing out the remnants of Hamas, uh, something different than what you've been doing. We would like a ceasefire at the start so that we could rush aid in and prevent what is an imminent, imminent famine so we got this whole thing, you know, that we'd like to present to you, this whole idea, this whole humane approach to solving your terrorist problem. Now, what was very interesting to me was we got a phone call from a woman. She was very, very polite, and she was, uh, you know, really cautious with the way she said things because she knew what she was saying was something counter to, uh, you know, what I had been explaining. And I appreciated that she did it that way because that makes conversation possible. And it also makes me curious and makes me want to go find the clip she was talking about. Now, she told us that she had seen Clarissa Ward, who is a very brave, incredible war reporter, war correspondent, goes to the war zone, has been doing this work for 20 years, talking to uh, some people. Now, she got confused, as most people do, between the West Bank and Gaza. And she gets she got it a little confused about the The extremists in Israel, like the American extremists, are a very slight minority. But of course, they do get all the attention, don't they? Here and there. Don't have time to listen to the live show? Want to hear more on your schedule? Go to randyroads.com and buy a stinking podcast.